I was the bright blonde hair and blue sailor suits and you do what you're supposed to do. We had the dogs in the river and homemade biscuits and life was wonderful. Uh, Fisher was the athletic trainer for the football team. What a great place for a pedophile. I hold the school much more responsible than Fisher, you know, not because they have deep pockets, because I think they just willfully let children get hurt. I was born to a schizophrenic mother. Um, she was not able to care for me because of her mental illness. So I was placed with my aunt. My aunt was a very strict disciplinary. I grew up in church. Um, I would say it became very physically um, abusive. At the age of four, I started to be sexually abused by some adult cousins who were also in the household. Margaret Holser. I am a two-time Olympian, three-time Olympic medalist. So I was abused from five to seven years old um, by a good friend of mine's father. I was going to their house on a regular basis for play dates. They were coming to my house on a regular basis. So this was a man that I trusted, that you know, my parents trusted. My dad uh, moved back and forth from the United States to Guatemala so he pr can provide for the family. And in the, the Latin American community, is we just tend to, to live in a large cluster of people. And um, when my mom used to go out with my other aunts to go shopping, they left my older cousins there to stay with us. And it was this one specific cousin. Um, but it was him specifically that, that kind of targeted me. As a child, you don't think of, of adults as manipulative or, or hurtful or anything like that. But I can tell you that the first time I met this man, I had concerns about him, and yet we continued to allow him to be a part of our lives. And part of that was because there was a professional relationship. He was on staff with my husband um, at, at our church. Well, there was a cousin, a female cousin of mine that used to come and visit often. And it just started off as little small events leading up to much larger events. You know, she would have me to touch her or she would try to touch me. The other abuse um, started around age seven. And um, my mom, she had a live-in boyfriend at the time who was a firefighter. He would sneak into my room in the middle of the night, and initially, I thought I was a dream. What was more traumatic about the experience for me was feeling helpless. It was, I, I would beg my parents not to leave me at this, at this house, but they would go out for the weekend, and so um, they, they would leave me there as, as a babysitter. And I would know it was going to happen, and I would just be so angry, and... Uh, and then everybody would go to sleep and I would just wait for him to come. I grew up in the picture perfect family. I was called the debutante Miss America. I was the first Miss America that they ever brought a family up on stage. My father continued to sexually v v violate children and teenagers until he died at age 75. You know, I was a regular kid, you know, my Unfortunately for us, my parents, uh, they didn't know that they were bringing someone who was a pedophile in. He was the, actually the teenage son of our, our babysitter. I still cannot even say what really happened other than he sex, had sexual acts with me and had me perform them, but I still can't say it. I mean, I don't know if I ever will. I feel I had to free myself from feeling guilty, uh, feeling responsible, like I was dirty. Um, who would want me? You know, it's all these things are in your head. How could someone hurt me like this if I have any type of value? How could somebody do this to me and care about me in any way, shape, or form? I really must be nothing. Out of that situation was born uh, of just a deep anger in me, a resentment towards adults, 
towards caretakers, the people in charge. And, um, and I also didn't understand that he didn't have the right to do this to me. I had a fear of saying no to people because I felt like if I said no, they were just gonna take it anyway. I became very bitter, very cold, very angry at the world. I felt like I didn't have any choices after that moment. I'm not who you think I am at all. I'm a really bad person. I was gonna kill myself. And that's what I feel that was taken from me, um, my virginity, uh, my youth. You're never the same after that. There's a part of me from this that can give love, but has trouble really receiving deep love because I never feel that I'm really worthy of it. I held a lot of resentment toward my mom for many years because I could not understand how she didn't know. I could not understand how you didn't know that this man was sneaking out of your bed and into mine. My mother telling me that uh, we were going to have a family member that was going to move with us to the United States because he needed to um, raise some money. He was trying to get his life together. And then I remember coming home from high school and it was that cousin that had, you know, raped me when I was a kid. Nobody outside of the home should know what's going on inside the home. And it's a terrible, terrible belief. It goes so far even to the extent that the perpetrator is often protected just so that it doesn't get out. My mother walked down the hallway one night. He'd been in my room for maybe a half hour. And all of a sudden, I, I heard footsteps coming down. I could hear the first step and then the second step, very, very, very slowly, and then the third step. And she was now about 12 feet from my door, and I waited to hear another step. And it was just, it was a dramatic moment when everything stopped for all three of us. All three of us knew exactly what each one of us was thinking and knew. It's the only time I ever felt my father afraid. He, he just stopped. And I thought, it's going to be over. She's going to come in. And we waited for that dramatic moment. And then I heard a step up the steps and up the steps and up the steps. And I knew she would never come through that door. And I knew she would never, ever come to help me. Maybe she just couldn't deal with it, so she just put it somewhere and, w and wouldn't think about it. But I do believe she made a decision. I, I believe she made a choice and she didn't choose me. Going into camping trips, I knew, you know, I'm gonna have a blast until nighttime comes, and then he's gonna make me take my clothes off and lay in bed while he touches me. She um, decided to, to make me touch her, and she, of course, me, and she, um, ultimately wanted me to lick her and um, so I had to do that and I did that and that was one of the worst memories I have. It was a memory that I um, I tucked away for a very long time. I remember being 16 years old and him pinning me against the wall and he said something like, I'm gonna show you what I should have showed you those years ago and try to do it again. There were many occasions that he um, tried to force himself onto me, um, make me watch pornographic videos and try to make me do the things that were in the videos. She said, you said he pried you open. I said, I did say that mother because they're writing that he abused me. And that's a very easy word to dismiss. If I say he pried me open, which he did, that's a visual that helps people to better understand what he did to me thousands of times over 13 years. For some reason, as a child, you don't speak up about those things. I, can't, I don't know why. I try, I, t I try to think back, like, why didn't I just say what was going on? 
And I really don't know why I didn't just come out and say that that was happening. I, I, maybe it's because I wasn't so sure that it was right or wrong. I just knew that I didn't like it and I didn't want it to happen anymore. What words would a sixth grader use to, oh, may I have some coffee? And by the way, my, this teacher put me in his mouth. But I remember when she thought something, she called me in her, bed, her and my dad's bedroom. She went, don't you let nobody touch you. Well, it had already happened. And the way she said it made me feel like, now that I've already let it happen, how can I tell you? Because you'd be mad at me. My sister is four years younger than me, so I never wanted him to touch her. I could have gone to my grandmother's house and stayed. You know, I had teachers at school that really cared about me that I could have gone to, but I chose to stay and endure what I was enduring because I figured if I left that he would then turn on her. And it wasn't like some creepy guy with a, with a trench coat on. It's our babysitter's son. He was funny, he had a Porsche. He didn't come asking for help or anything like that. He came offering to help. He was always a part of the game. He was very charismatic. People liked being around him. A lot of talk and Mr. Cool. Very respectful. Kind of like a grandfather type. If we were playing tag, he was playing. If we were climbing trees, he was climbing trees with us. A real upstanding, you know, good kid. He was a natural leader. He was from my community. He made himself the person who solved problems for people. He'd worked with children all of his life. I drank all, every day. And so it's really hard to be a s junior in high school drinking every day and function. When you hold something for 26 years, I mean, never tell a soul. Um, even though I could bury it, it still would just always come up. And when I finally did it, my body just fell apart. I started getting sick all the time. I started. Um, having weird headaches, I started having, getting just really sick all the time and eventually to the point where I couldn't stay conscious. At the age of 16, I became a, a teenage mom without any resources to provide for myself. I could not provide for my daughter. I sent her to stay with her father and I was devastated because I felt that not only did my mom not raise me, now I am repeating that. And I became suicidal. I was very um, depressed. And so when this guy that I met at the mall offered me a new life, I wanted to run and I wanted a new life. The, uh, the pimp came back after a couple of hours and he said he had to go over the rules with me. And he said things like, I have to take $200 an hour, talk to this kind of guy, that kind of guy. He gave me a new name, a new birthday. And you know, when I look back too, I think uh, I kind of went through a lot of women too, just to always prove uh, for myself, my sexuality and um, things like that. So for me, that was my coping mechanism, to emotionally shut down and just expect the worst from everybody. I've been married for 10 years now. And it's not until now, it took me 10 years to figure out that sex is not just something you do. You, you know, sex is a, is a special bond. And somebody just took that from me. Generally, in our culture, adults' rights trump children. So we believe the adults over the children, and we um, tend to think more about the impact on the adult than on the child. We think about the disruption to this person who harmed the child's life, career, and reputation more than the trauma to the child. 
Law enforcement is never going to investigate, investigate their way out of these type of crimes, these crimes against children. It's only through prevention that we can help stem the tide. We are going to have to help people in our world understand how trauma impacts not just the child, but without treatment and without intervention, how it really impacts almost every social ill that we spend so much money on every day in this country. Um, if we begin to have policies in our churches, in our youth serving organizations, that both educates the adults as well as educates the kids and it creates a, a different kind of social norm that is gonna make say that this is something that our, our community cares about kids and our community cares about stopping sexual abuse. Corporations have a huge role in how these children are viewed, how they view sex objects, and they need to take a stand to make sure that children continue to be children and they're not portrayed as sexual objects, they're not portrayed as making them a sexual item or being sexualized. We also need a clear message, which we are not giving now in our society, that it is not okay for adults to sexually use their own or anybody else's children. You know, this, this does happen. Abuse happens. It happened in 1950. It happened yesterday. Um, it can unravel and cause lots of damage, or you can stop it, interrupt it, and limit the collateral damage. So back to your original question, why was I willing to do this? You know, if you can stop the collateral damage here, as opposed to 18 years later, that makes a huge difference. And you, if you spare one child, I mean, people don't have a clue the ripples from one job. So you stop one source of ripples. I mean, that is huge. Mm -hmm.